Ashley Dillion is a Pilates instructor and membership business pro who sold her studio and has taken her practice entirely online. She's built a thriving membership community and I got the chance to ask her how she did it, plus what lessons she learned along the way. I highly recommend you watch the entire thing because she's got some incredible advice for membership business owners just like you. You haven't always run a profitable video membership business, so how was it you got started in that and how do we go from where you were before this, like how you got into Pilates to sitting here today? Well, this is um, one of my many career iterations as a Pilates instructor. So I've been a Pilates instructor for over 18 years. So I taught all through college. And then when I graduated, I went freelance and developed a private clientele really quickly. And within a year, I had more clients than I had time to travel all over the city renting for them. So I opened a brick and mortar and I owned a Pilates studio for nine years in Manhattan. And it was amazing and extremely exclusive. Um, we were referral only. I had five instructors who worked for me and I taught there. So I managed, I taught and I ran the studio. And in 2020, when the world halted, it was really clear to me that businesses like mine in New York City were not legally going to be open for months, many more months than anybody else sort of thought. And my Instagram kind of accidentally blew up at the same time. So I went from having like 6,000 followers to having like 10,000 followers in a month. Wow. And it had taken me like, you know, a year to get 6,000 followers. So I started teaching IG lives and teaching all of my clients from the studio virtually. So I overnight just became a fully virtual instructor and wow. rearranged my Brooklyn apartment to create like a space to teach from. And I started creating a lot of content for Instagram and my following kept growing and growing and growing. And it became clear to me that I needed to start monetizing my IG lives. So I started researching what what was the next step? And at that time, there weren't a lot of people who were running live stream classes without Zoom. So my options at the time were really limited. Uscreen came up, Vimeo came up, and maybe one other provider came up. And I started looking into, well, how do I rent these classes after I've taught them? that I can maximize my time investment into them. And then that directed my mind into, what are we working toward? Is this a long-term commitment or is this a patch? And I decided it was not a patch. I decided it was a long-term commitment. I was not reopening my studio. I did not think that that was a wise business move, but I also was really enjoying the virtual landscape so much more than I expected to. I, my Instagram community continued to blow up within, you know, six months I had a hundred thousand followers. I now have 250 something like 256 or 257 or something like that. I started teaching live streams through my OTT. I never taught a zoom, not once, but I started teaching those paid classes, November, 2020. I launched my full OTT in April, 2021. I kind of want to go back and talk about your Instagram. Cause you mentioned you had like 6,000 followers and then kind of caught some traction and that jumped to 10,000. What, what do you attribute going from 6,000 to 257,000 followers? I mean, the first most obvious thing is that I started sharing my practice on the mat exclusively. So I went from having some that was mat, mostly that was apparatus based to one week of only mat and props home practice. To me, I thought, okay, this makes sense. This is a confluence of I'm now posting something that's more accessible along with everybody is doing nothing but staring at their phones, right? Like that first week of shutdown, our first week of shutdown was different because like those first two weeks of shutdown in New York City, other places were still open, right? but the whole world was freaking out on their phones, right? So I can understand how I shot from a very niche following to being a little bit more broad I think that what helped me grow the Instagram community was using, first of all, I showed up every, I didn't take a day off for a year and a half at all. Mm. I always posted for the first year I posted two or three times a day. Um, I utilized every feature they had. So 
I did a live every single week. I was on stories every day. I did a video and I did static posts. This is before reels. Um, I shared teaching content that was guided as well as more aspirational content. Um, I shared, Hey, tips for whatever. Like I just tried to diversify what I was sharing within my niche as much as I possibly could. And I showed up every single day. I never left a DM unanswered. I never left a comment unanswered. I mean, it was like, it's still being on social is an insanely full-time job. There really are no days off. Um, I took it really seriously because I saw that um, a, it was fun for me to connect with thousands of people all over the world on Pilates and creative movement in a way that I'd never really found in New York city. And B, I saw that it was like my way to shift into the next business. So I just always saw it as both. And I think what's really important is I never, ever shared anything that didn't feel right and true to me mm-hmm. and my brand. Like every single thing I put out there always feels aligned with my higher message. And that's still true because at the end, I always knew like as much as I, it may feel very real, like I am a brand, I'm still behind the screen and the messaging is really important. I know you mentioned you did live streams as you were building, but did you monetize those live streams and how did you go about that? And then how did, how did your monetization then evolve moving forward? So I went from live streams that were on Instagram. So those were free to mm-hmm. moving to before I started doing, I'll say this before I started doing live streams through my OTT through you screen, I did dabble in like affiliate links. So I sort of took this moment of like, am I going to be more successful as an influencer or more as a creator? So an influ- mm-hmm. so I would say the difference being an influencer works on behalf of other brands mostly and a creator mostly works on behalf of their own brand and creates partnerships that support that brand. I now do both. Um, but at the time I had this moment of like, I need to figure out what my audience wants. Like who is my audience? They see that they're taking my classes. I see that they like my posts, but, and I see the demographic of where they're from, but I don't really know what they want from me. What are they willing to pay for from me? And it became really clear to me that they did not want to buy my leggings or my foam rollers, or my mats, or any of that. Mm. And so I thought, I'm no longer pouring any energy into that for a while. And I'm just going to pour the energy into the classes. So at first, I was teaching both an IG Live and the class on Uscreen every week. And then I phased out my classes on IG Lives and only taught them on Uscreens. And I didn't sell many of those on demand, honestly, like people would sign up for class and then do the replay. I would get a lot of emails of like, I didn't do it in time. Can I, you know, extend the access? And I'd say, you know, fine. Okay. Um, My access is really short. It's 24 hours. It's really meant Mm -hmm. to be take a class and move on, not take a class and do it over and over again. Um, And so there was this little sticky period of time where I worried like, is this going to translate to the on demand or not? But it really did. All those people who were consistently taking classes, they all became on demand members immediately. Hmm. Um, so the jump was really from making no money to making. So I was charging 15 per head in my uh, dropping classes and the live stream classes. And then my membership price is twenty nine ninety nine a month. So those people became most of those people became monthly members. Um, and once I launched that and had that going for a little, then I started to dabble back into influencing. And now oh. that's like a thing that I do as well. Why did you choose a membership model versus selling bundles of classes or maybe just going into doing uh, live stream access or some other form of monetization? I thought that it was the wisest business decision for the product I was trying to sell. I have excellent retention with people who want to stay with me. Mm. People who stay with me historically stay with me long term. So I didn't think that I was really the kind of instructor that you just want to take a class and then maybe like a month later revisit and I'm like in your rotation. I know that the products that I offer touches people in a unique way and that no one really offers the type of instruction that I do. 
and that people want a more long-term relationship with me. And also that I enjoy building that. Like in my membership, I have a lot of programs that involve progressions and a lot of different paths and a lot of ways to prepare you. And a lot of what I do in terms of translating what I offer on Instagram to the membership is showing something that's aspirational and then saying, okay, so when you're in the membership, if you want to do this, these are the four or five videos that you want to do to get yourself to that point. So for me, the idea of selling a bundle, so someone just has five classes and then that's it. And then they go to their next thing. Like that didn't seem like a fulfilling thing to build on my part or like the, I felt like that put me in the sea of online fitness and I'm much more niche than that. And I, I think it's always wise to go narrow and deep than to go mm. broad. You mentioned in terms of pricing that you wanted to offer something that was a little bit different, a little bit more high end, but was there anything else that went into landing on that price point for the membership or was it just kind of a gut feeling? <laughs> no, I did an insane amount of market research. I mean, I looked at everybody at the time who I tried to divide it into who was doing this before the pandemic who has popped up since the pandemic? Who's actually a teacher versus just like an influencer who has a big following? So like, no offense to people who are watching this, who may do this, but there are a lot of people on this app called Playbook who are, no offense to Playbook, but they're not actual instructors, trainers, whatever. It's just a really quick way to build an app. You can do it really quickly. It's a profit share model. So there isn't, a, there's, you know, there's real no, major overhead. There's not a lot of risk in your startup, but in order to be a creator on playbook, if somebody's taking your classes, they only, you only get paid when they're taking your classes, if they bought their initial membership using your link. So it's using this influencer, like the joke to me about playbook is that you're just a playbook influencer, right? You're not building your brand because everybody can be watching what you're sharing and you'll never get paid for it because maybe they signed up with a link through another trainer. Um, it was like clear to me that I did not, I could never compete with playbook pricing because their entire business model was different. So everybody who was on like that or tribe or any of those other apps that are a profit share model, I said, I'm, I can't even look at your pricing because my overhead is completely different. Right. Mm -hmm. So then I did insane deep dives into trying to figure out the back end of everybody's site of, did they work with a developer or did they also do a use screen or a Vimeo or whomever else? And I asked other people and I DM, I cold DM'd people and said, who are you working with? Um, I talked to a lot of people who don't use a platform the way we use it. And I looked at everybody's pricing model as compared to what is the system that they're using to stream? Um, what is their following like? What is their engagement rate like? And once I kind of looked at what everybody was offering, I you know landed on um, a very complicated ROI you know spreadsheet of what do I realistically think I can do in terms of numbers? Like there's a price of which if my membership is priced too low, I have to get way more followers to turn a profit. Do I actually think I can do that versus do I think I can get a smaller amount who's paying a little more and only cater to that small group? But are there enough of those people if I go too niche? So mm -hmm. I basically decided on a number, ran it through the ROI, you know, a million times and decided that it would be wiser to, I was rooting for $26.99 and I have, I had two people I was working with at the time who were helping me launch and they both said to me, you're a fool. Don't do that. You better do $29.99. And I thought, I'm really going to turn people off. I'm really worried, but I know I'm not 20. Mm. I know I'm not 19. I know I'm not nine. I know I'm at least 25. Um, and then I think I was on a call with somebody at Uscreen and they said to me, just remember, you can always run sales, but it's going to be very hard to raise people's rates. Mm. And that was a moment of like, I had never considered running sales before. Honestly, in my brick and mortar, I never ran sales and right. ever. Um, this was kind of a new concept to me. The concept of the way that you market a virtual product is very different than brick and mortar. And so then I went into a deep dive of that, of how people run their sales and how that would affect, like, what if I, what if I only gain members during sale times, like 
then my ROI calculator is like useless, right? It's no longer painting this picture for me. Um, so I just played around with it a lot like that. And there were definitely a lot of moments where I second guessed my price. Um, I no longer second guess my price. <laughs> Um, but I really just had to make a hard decision and yeah. stick to it for the consistency. And I'm really glad I did. Well, that leads me to a question about your content. Um, because one of the arguments that we make from time to time is that if you're constantly adding content to a membership, it makes your membership inherently more valuable. Right. Because somebody who joins your membership and you have 20 hours of content because you just launched or 10 hours, whatever it is, should should they be paying the same price as somebody who joins a year from now when you have 100 hours of content or mm -hmm. should that membership price have an increase because it's just inherently a more valuable catalog? So that, my question for you on that is. How often do you add new content? I will disagree with you on the constant new um, content, and I'll tell you why. So I release a lot of new content. I release at least two pieces of new content every week, usually more like three. Wow. I used to release three pieces every single week. So one of those is an hour-long live stream replay. So I host a live stream every single week, and then the replay is up. So there's always one hour class that's new every week. I always then release something else that is different from whatever the live stream, the live stream theme changes weekly. So if the live stream catered to one demographic of people in my membership, then I release something that's a little different. So maybe that's the live stream is advanced. So that means that the new release is intermediate or beginner, or it involves props or it's a different concept or whatever, different format. And then I typically release something else for the first, I would say year and a half. I always released three a week and that, but the problem with that is so now I have a lot of content. Like I have over 300 videos in my library. And the problem becomes if your content is not easy to navigate, it doesn't matter how much content is hmm. there. And if your content doesn't feel useful to people in a way that they're using your membership site, then it doesn't matter how much new content you release. So hmm. I'll give you the example of a new member. So I just ran a sale for Black Friday and I was spent, I was spending a lot of time thinking about what is the new content that I want to release during that week and the fall and the subsequent week, because I want to make sure that all those people who joined stay past their free trial and stay with me. And so I thought, okay, well, the first thing I want to make sure that I release that week is something that's really accessible. If you've never worked out with me, that isn't quite as niche. And it's just like, if you've done any sort of Pilates or mindful movement, you can follow it, but it kind of has my style stamped on it. Like, okay, a new video. That's good for that. But the next video was kind of like, every single one of my videos is new to them. So maybe what's more valuable to offer somebody who's new is not another 301 new video. Maybe it's a new collection of, uh, or a path or a short program or something that creates value out of the content that's there or something that helps somebody who's new navigate how to use mm. the membership. So. I released something new, but instead of thinking about it as like, this is new for my new members, it was more like, I'm releasing something new for my existing members, plus a live stream. And then I made a new collection of different collections of videos if you're new to the membership. So one is like, I'm a total beginner. I've never done anything before. One is, I'm not new to movement, but I'm returning after a break. And another one was, I'm not new to Pilates. I have an existing practice, but I'm new to Ashley Deli on Pilates. And I put that at the top. I switched the order in which the categories appear below so that it would kind of feed into that narrative. I started marketing my weekly workout differently. So I basically was trying to show how much value already exists within the membership and how you can use the membership to further your own practice as opposed to here's something new, here's something new, here's something new that you know, doesn't feel like it, like it doesn't go beyond the fact that it's novel. How do you approach marketing your membership to new potential members? Because it, I, I'm listening to, to you talking through how deeply you think about each thing. You have to be thinking about marketing. I'm constantly thinking. So my Instagram is my marketing. 
right? right. So my, my Instagram has, you know, ev- since my membership launched, my it's just that is my conversion tool. I've never paid for paid marketing ever. Once, when I first launched, I had an I had like a post on Instagram and I, you know, boosted the post, spent like a hundred dollars right. boosting it. That's it. So I've, you know, I would argue I've paid with it for it with my time, which is like I've spent a lot of time on my own marketing, but all of my marketing is organic. I think that's really, really important for a couple of reasons. Number one, I've looked into what other people do when they place your content, and more importantly, I create content for other brands. I see what happens, right? Like I, when I do influencing work for other brands and it appears on my channel, but I'm, you know, promoting their brand and I'm using their language and, you know, it's being targeted to this demographic. I see loads of problems where I'm like, this doesn't feel natural. This doesn't feel organic. It's not going to speak to people. And their marketing team is like, no, no, our research shows this and legal says we need to use this language and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I see the back end of what happens. I'm like, yeah, no one tapped your link because you didn't yeah. appeal to them in a real way. Like you you had me create a commercial, which is fine. I believe in the mm-hmm. product. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. But, you know, conceptually, it's not a way to speak to people. So I have so much freedom in my Instagram because I can share whatever I want and I am the boss. So it's kind of like, I, yeah, I do a lot of influencing for a brand. It's just my brand, right? Like I'm constantly promoting my own brand. Everything that I share has a very consistent message of an intentional self practice that you do this practice for yourself. It's, mm-hmm. I'm not a normal gym trainer. If you want to go do the normal gym trainer, we do cardio and weights. Like I'm not for you and I don't need to pretend to try to get those people as customers. What I'm looking for in customers are people who see my content and it speaks to them in some way that is different and unique from what other people do. And then to share enough aspects of the message that are not promoting the membership so that when I do promote the membership and I'm connecting the dots between what I share that's totally organic and doesn't seem related to, hey, by the way, I have this product you can pay for where I can help you with what I do, that it feels organic and it feels natural. So if I have a new program, for instance, to promote, like I'm working on a new program now that's launching in January. So as I'm creating the program, I'm thinking in my head of, I need to start creating Instagram content that kind of echoes the program and start weaving that in now so that we're planting the seeds so that then when I announce what the program is, people, it somehow feels familiar or it somehow seems interesting or, oh, I think I've seen her do that. I want to do that. Um, So it's very grassroots in the sense that like I cultivated and created the community and now I'm marketing to them. But I would say there's a very fine line with using the algorithm to do that and not turning the algorithm against you. Right. Um, right. Like we talk, we, people complain about the algorithm all the time. And it's just like, it's very obvious. The algorithm does not want you to constantly push products on the audience. The algorithm wants you to be a person who has something to sell. So it's a fine line. Like, um, story views are a really good example. So story views convert really, really well links and stories. But the more story frames that promote something with a link that takes people outside of the app, the less the app wants to show that to your audience. So the most unwise thing you can do is to post your very first story frame with a link that takes people outside the app because no one will be served that story. You'll have like a thousand views for the story. If you share a story that's organic about your life or what you're doing, you've got like 10,000, 20,000 views on that story. And then the next story frame is going to go down and then you weave your links into organic content so that the algorithm isn't constantly like, hey, stop getting people off of our app. The point is to keep people on our app. So I've always argued that that's not something you can have a marketing team do for you. Nobody knows my audience the way I do. Um, So that's a really, really big part of my job is reading the room and taking the temperature and marketing based on that. In terms of getting people from Instagram to your site and converting, have you tried any different kinds of strategies like, let's say, offering a piece of content for free and then doing emails to kind of nurture them towards conversion or... um... I would say the free 
live stream was great because it got, I would compare it to the giveaway funnels, right? So what were lead zones and are now giveaway funnels. Um, and for anybody watching, that's when you offer a free workout in exchange for an email. That's very different than just logging onto a page and getting a free workout and not having to enter anything. So I knew that I wanted to hit it from both angles over the sale weekend of like, here's some free workouts. And then you get to the page and you realize you have to enter your email versus just show up and do the live stream. And I'm going to leave the live stream link open for you for a while. Both of those did well, but it's hard to say um, the live stream doing better. Anytime I share a workout that you don't have to enter an email for, it gets way more views than entering an email. Just like on my, like if you go to my website, there's a pop-up forum. I'll send you a free workout to your inbox if you, you know, join my mailing list. And like that conversion is meh. You know, it's like not amazing. It's surprising to me how few people take that. What really does well are when I have an Instagram post that does really well organically. And I say, hey, do you want to do a workout that's just like that? Or do you want to learn this flow? It's in the membership. When things organically work out that way, that is the absolute best conversion. Um, so like, let's say there's like a carousel that I've posted and it's in a unique workout. Um, I have one that I posted not too long ago where I have the audio on so you can hear me breathing. That converted like crazy. Like that turned into, you know, my Instagram analytics, it turned into like, you know, thousands of website clicks. It turned into that week, a lot of people typing my name into a browser and that's how they found my, that's how they got to my site as opposed to going through the app. So I'll like post the Instagram version and then I'll post like a clip of me teaching the same content with a link to the free trial that converts very well. Um, and sales convert really well. So I would say I use everything available within Uscreen, like the giveaway funnels, running free things. I did a free challenge not too long ago. Um, but at the end of the day, honestly, organic will always win in, in terms um, of the best conversion rate. I will say, however, the upsell has been a very good tool that I've been using in the marketing tab. What is what has the experience been like with that tool? It, like, is there a before and after that you've seen with that? So for anybody who's watching, the upsell is is basically somebody's at checkout and they're going to check out for one thing and you're trying to sell them something that's more expensive. So you offer them a discount to incentivize it. So for me, my upsell is I just have two plans. I have a monthly and an annual and my upsell is you're about to check out for the monthly, but Hey, you really should do the annual and I'm going to give you a big discount to incentivize the annual. I have mixed feelings about annual memberships in general. I'm constantly trying to figure out what, at what point in, in the churn rate do people quit the monthly, right? Like, when do I lose them? Do they follow mm. two 30 day programs and then they're out? Or uh, so is it, does it make sense to turn those people into an annual with a steep discount or does it not? Or do they stay around for six months? Because if they stay around for six months, then upselling them an annual at a, you know, 40 or 50% discount doesn't make sense. So I'm constantly trying to figure that out. And I was really, really hesitant to offer a deep discount on the upsell. And then my person at Uscreen was like, I really think <laughs> you should try. So I did two things. Um, one, before they get to that checkout page, I created a landing page that just, there was like a step in between putting what you want in the cart and then actually checking out that mm -hmm. to me felt very cold and like <laughs> it, it had no information on it or the information it did wasn't very interesting. It wasn't engaging. And there's this argument of like, do we create a landing page that feels a little more engaging, but then it's an extra step or do we not? And then if we use the upsell, then we're tacking on like a whole additional step in the customer journey. Like, is that worth it? So the first thing we did was add this extra step of a landing page that looks more dynamic and looks more interesting and is more, um, it looks a little bit more like, hey, look at all this value you're getting. I ran that for like two weeks and noticed immediately that it was doing better. I wouldn't say it was doing phenomenally better, but it definitely was improving the abandoned cart thing of like, I'm gonna put this in my cart and ooh, I'm not actually gonna pull the trigger and buy it. And then we did, we turned the upsell up to a higher percentage and that converted pretty well right away. And I still have that on you know, and I have like abandoned cart things on and things like that. But that, the other thing I, 
have been doing is I've been changing all of the language when mm. I have something going on of all of those automated things because I find that when I get those automated things, it feels very cold and salesy. So I continuously updated the language. Like when I was running a Black Friday sale, the abandoned cart and the upsell and everything mentioned the sale. Um, when I have a different program going on, like I mentioned the program in those automated, it's not like just set it and forget it. I'm trying to, I try to be more thoughtful of like, every time we contact you, we're giving you something that's relevant. That's how everyone should do it <laughs> for anyone listening. Right, that is how everyone should do it. It should it should be personal. It should be warm and it shouldn't feel cold. And like this is on autopilot 12 months a year for the next 10 years. Yeah, but it's easy to like when you're wearing a million hats running the business, yeah. right? It's easy to forget those automated emails. Um, luckily, I take myself through the customer journey enough that like I'm getting the emails. And so sometimes I get the email and I go, Oh, I didn't really like that. Like that. Mm. I don't know. There's something about it. it didn't feel right. Like I need yeah. to go edit it right now. If you could go back to when you were starting this video membership process, what advice would you give to yourself? So what I could have done, and I wish I had done this, is I wish that when I launched my live streams, I had just launched the unlimited membership right away and just said, if you join, you know, you get access to everything we're building together. And as I release new videos, I would love it if I could get feedback and maybe I would have offered those people some sort of grandfathered mm. rate or some sort of reduced rate in those early days, but not as a beta. I did a beta test. The beta test wasn't helpful, like not as a beta. I should have done it as a public thing of just, this is me and my process and you're invited to join the process and I would love your support in the process. I'll give you a discounted rate. And then I could have taken a lot of feedback of what people actually wanted and looked at the metrics of what are the videos that are getting the most play so that I wasn't making those decisions when I was a hundred videos in, I would have been making those decisions when I was like 30 videos in alas, here we are. <laughs> I, I know what you you're know. talking about. Well, thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself and your business with us today. I'm very grateful for the time and it's very evident that you care deeply about the work that you're doing. And thank you. Thank you for that. If you like this video, YouTube thinks you're going to love the one on screen right now. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.